All right. Welcome back to Jeff Kunanga Live. Let's get right to it. Dr. P.L.O. Lumumba, come all the way, Ganja. They've been sitting here very patiently. They know what we're discussing today. In fact, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Good to Thank see you, you both. Thank you. Good to be here. 33 days to go before the election. 33 days to go. And then today, this bombshell, the presidential debate 2017, and this is a letter uh, by the s committee. Washira Waruru, who's chairman of the steering committee of the presidential debate. Monica, if I could just read one paragraph. Monica, if we can just put it up. He says, uh, we have taken note of statements issued by political parties suggesting that they were not consulted by Debates Media Limited. We wish to clarify that members of the steering committee on the presidential debates have been in constant communication with the various campaign teams even before the announcement was made in May. Further, the guidelines, including the format of the debate, were not only communicated to the various campaign teams, but were also published on the broadcast, print, and online platforms of the participating media houses. Last week, all presidential campaign teams were invited for a pre-debate briefing in line with our guidelines. Come on the way, guys. Are you surprised at what the two main principals did today? I, well, maybe not surprised, because... Um if you look at it from the perspective of the incumbent, uh, you don't want to be in a debate if you can avoid it because it's always a very difficult place to be because there are more questions for you and usually incumbents lose debates. So now once the incumbent had said no, I am not surprised that his major competitor said no. Mm. But the reality is that th the country requires these candidates at all levels to debate and it's not just about the entertainment value of the debate but it's also because we need to keep the the what's the word we demystifying leadership because ultimately these are people who are seeking employment from kenyans it's important for us to hear them often most times when politicians speak they speak to us it's important when they are questioned i think the rules of the game need to be clear which who, who who is asking which questions have any questions been leaked to any of them all those things need to be sorted out. But once that is sorted, I think it's important for that conversation. It is not about changing the voting patterns. I doubt, other than uh, Abdul Badida, mm. I doubt that there's one who lives with any significant change in the voting patterns because of a debate. Right. But I think it's a good culture, and I think it's healthy. Yeah. yeah. Pilo? I'm not surprised myself. I hold the view, like Kwaiganjo, that for the incumbent is very difficult because there are many questions that we would want to pose. But yet I also hold the view that we ought to interrogate these individuals, particularly the key participants. There are a number of fringe candidates, but the two individuals ought to be interrogated in a cerebral environment because your typical political rallies are extravaganzas <laughs> with a lot of razzmatazz, mm. and they speak to us, speak at us, but when you are in an, a controlled environment, we are going to ask you about agriculture. We are going to ask you the difficult question. Mm. And I hope that they will change their minds. In fact, what I would love, after a very careful thought, is a direct debate between Honorable Raila Odinga and President Kenyatta so yeah. that we are able to interrogate critical issues that affect this nation. Yeah. As Waiganjo has said, I don't think that he's going to change the voting pattern fundamentally. But I want to hear President Kenyatta talk to me about what he has done in the last four years. I want to hear Raila Odinga talk to me about what he intends to do and uh, also speak to some of the controversial statements that he has made so that somebody who believes that I am a cerebral voter will be swayed by the manner in which they undertake to deal with those critical issues. Yeah, come on, though, uh, yeah. PLO mentioned um, Abdul Badida. He's taken them to court. He's taken uh, debates limited to court, and that will be ruled tomorrow. Now, he says, uh, this is what I believe, uh, this debate was going to be divided into two sections. One section for the others, uh, yes. if you will. Yes. Yes. The unknowns, if you will. And then later on in prime time, the two main contenders. Mm. Is, is that fair? I think it's reasonable. I think let's also recognize that we're not just looking also for entertainment, which is what if you have 10 people, uh, some of whom obviously will never be president, mm -hmm. well, not never be, but won't be president of this, in mm -hmm. this election, mm -hmm. because this election is between Honorable Raila Odinga and President Uhuru Kenyatta. 
the rest of the people it's good to hear them but if you bring them on the on the platform together it will confuse the issues because what will become it will become a workshop you know with everybody having three minutes to say something we want the principal candidates to speak comprehensively on the critical issues mm. there's another aspect jeff which mm. is important mm. the supporters of these candidates a lot of the, there's a lot of tension in the core areas where these supporters come from it's important to see uhuru kenyatta and uh, raila odinga in a relaxed environment mm. conversing with one another and telling kenyans this is not a life and death issue it lowers the temperatures mm. kenyans almost think that if these two are in the same room they start clobbering each other yeah. because that's what we would want to do. Right. We need to tell people that it's not that bad. These are just Kenyans seeking leadership. Let's hear them. It's not a big deal. They've made mistakes. They have historical questions to answer. To answer, it's important that that environment be there. But if you do that when you have 10 people, it, it, it completely destroys the ability for us to do that. Yeah, it waters yeah. it down. That's yeah. a very good it point. It does, yeah. What, very good point. Bielo, uh, what if as Kamoto was saying, the leakage factor. Maybe they got some leakage that the people moderating these debates weren't people they were going to be comfortable with. Present company excluded. <laughs> but what should it matter? If I'm going to be the moderator, you are the moderator, and you are presidential candidate, I don't care whether it's Lucifer himself <laughs> who is interrogating me or the angel Gabriel. Because the issues are clear. We are going to question you on how you are going to deal with corruption. Mm. We are going to question you on how you are going to run the economy. You've made promises about education and health. We are going to question you. And if you are a good debater and a good candidate and latter-day Lucifers ask you questions that are not worthy, mm. you tell them that that question is not up to scratch. So I don't think that that in and of itself should be something that scares one. Mm. I think that a leader should be prepared mm. for any person to question them. What is critical, and I must advert to this as Kamodo has said, is that I think that the key candidates must be allowed to debate one on one. Because the others, and I respect them, I respect the Kurwa Court, I respect Nyaga and every one of them, but the truth is, they are not going to be president during this circle. Yeah. Who, the, 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 the country is divided into what I call the Jubilites and the Nazarites. <laughs> and the <laughs> representatives of the two formations is Honorable Raila Odinga yes. and His Excellency Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta. I would yeah. want to see these individuals head to head, adverting to critical issues. So I don't agree with uh, my good friend... Uh, Abdiba about this idea that all of them should be present and they are asking questions. It's not a high school debate. <laughs> this is a serious issue yeah. mm -hmm. about the nation of Kenya and how we are going to deal with Vision 2030, Africa Agenda, uh, Agenda 2063, how we are going to deal with SDGs, how we are going to liberate people from poverty. And the truth be told, I don't have to be a Jewish prophet, the truth is Jubilites, Nazarites. And the leaders are Raila Odinga, Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta. Those are the ones that I want to see. Yeah. Trust PLO to add two new words to the dictionary. <laughs> the Nazarites. I'm not that Jubilites one. and Nazarites. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Real quick before we end this topic. Come on, do you hope that by Monday they will have changed their minds? At least, you know, just... I, I, I hope so, and I think there will be a change of mind. I, I, think, I think both of them um, desire to be heard by Kenyans. And the truth of the matter is that whereas the, the, the debate does not change uh, people's choice about who they'll vote for, I think it does give passion to their, to their support base. Mm -hmm. and, and that helps in turning them out. So, so it, may, it, it is not so much about whether someone who came in to vote for Rayla or Dinga will now change and vote for, for Jubilee. But someone who was voting for Jubilee is more convinced and therefore is more committed to coming out. And this is an election that is going to depend on turnout. So anything that you can do to enthuse your supporters, the better. I have to say, however, that you always need to recognize that the debate, the debate rules need to be negotiated, particularly when you, when you debate between an incumbent and persons who are seeking to come in. You don't want the situation that we had in the debate. Uh, between the Nairobi gov gov gubernatorial candidates, yeah. which became, you know, a farce. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the, we want a serious discussion, not a place for name calling and people uh, throw out things that they are not required to to uh, substantiate. That cannot be allowed. So the rules also need to help a sober debate, not one that allows for name calling. You know, yeah. I was going to mention the Nairobi debate. I'm glad you brought it up. Pilo, what were your thoughts on that, real quick? 
I, I can't agree with uh, Waiganjo more that there is a sense in which you've got to moderate the debate so that the critical issues are teased out. There is a sense in which they did come out, mm. but I, I do not like a debate to degenerate into name calling. I mm. want to be told what you are going to do about water in Nairobi, what you are going to do about garbage, and all those other issues can also be dealt with, but in a subtle cerebral fashion, mm. so that it doesn't degenerate into name calling and people lose sight, as I've said before, of the antelope and chasing the little squirrels, which don't help anybody. Indeed. So I can't agree more that the rules of engagement must be clear and we must focus on the issues and that is what Nairobians and Kenyans are concerned about. PLO, 33 days, 33 nights to go before the elections. Uh, the EU came out and said that there's a high possibility of violence. Was that right for them to come and say that? No, I don't think so. This, this idea that there will be a doomsday scenario in Kenya is completely misguided. There may be a few conflicts here and there, but we are sufficiently mature. I think that Kenyans are going to come out and vote very passionately. There may be one or two person throwing stones. Those, those are uh, tantrums that I expected when you are dealing with the millions. But Kenya will be a going concern on the 9th day of August, and I am not one who is writing <coughs> Kenya's obituary. And, and, and it irritates me. When people come into this country, come into African countries, and in a very condescending manner, they parachute in, and then they go out, and they have made judgment after being in Kenya for only a few hours. I think it is insulting, and I think they ought to be told that it's not theirs to say, we can't go into their countries and say that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So they've got to be brought to order. And I thought that President Kenyatta would have done that. And I think that uh, Honorable Raila should also do that mm -hmm. and tell them, please, when you are visitor, there are unwritten and alterable rules of behavior and conduct of decorum. Be decorous. Do you agree, Kamal? Uh, you know, what, there's a false narrative that uh, is very popular with uh, many Kenyans about how we are back to 207. Mm. I mean, Jeff, mm. this is not 207. Let me give you three examples. In 2007, uh, the, the, the opponents then demanded of President Kibaki that he changes the commission and appoints, I think it was replacement commissioners with people sub, uh, appointed through the IPPG format. Mm. President Kibaki said no, and he appointed people people believed were his friends to join the commission. In 2017, the opposition said they want a fresh commission. There was a fresh commission. Mm -hmm. In 2007, the opposition said they can't go to court. They will not submit themselves to dispute resolution. Why? Because the president had appointed the court that would, they would have been required to go before. The judges had been appointed by the president. They had a legitimate reason to say we're not going to... The court be, to, before us today is an independent judiciary. It has given numerous decisions that are actually against the incumbent, that are against the sitting government. This is a different time. In 2007... We had exclusion. The country was divided. It was the days of Siasa, Maya, Maishambaya. In 2017, we haven't gotten there, but clearly there's a lot more inclusion. There's incl even if there's not inclusion at, at the level we would like at the executive, there's exclusion, there's inclusion in the judiciary, there's significant inclusion in the legislature, there is devolution, which has allowed uh, law-based distribution of resources. So anyone who comes here and, 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 and parrots these statements about we are back to where we were, oh, Kenya is going to burn again, is irresponsible. And I think I agree with, with Dr. PLO. It is irresponsible. And especially because a lot of this is uninformed. It does that mean that we do not, we're not going to have some tensions? Inevitably, we had tensions uh, even during the nominations. Yeah. A lot of these are localized. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we're going to have the sort of problems we had in 2007. That does not, therefore, mean that we should, not, we should allow for a compromise election for that reason. Mm. That, that, that is not to say, therefore, it's not saying peace, 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 whatever sex. It's to say that even if there are problems in the electoral process, we have systems now that are reliable, let us apply them. Speaking of problems in the electoral process, does one side or the other have to win outright in the first round, Dr. Dr. Ari, just so that there is at least no doubt? You know, there is a sense in which the law, the rules are very clear. The threshold, the two thresholds about uh, 50 plus 1 mm. and 25% uh, in uh, 24, 24 counties. of the counties. Yes. I believe that if one achieves one side of the political divide, achieves that, and it is in an environment where the elections are conducted in a free, transparent and a fair manner, then wisdom will demand that the other side concedes. 
So I want to believe that we are dealing with rational human beings who are seeking office for the sake of serving Kenyans and if they are convinced that it was conducted in a free and proper environment as contemplated by the law, then they will make concessions. And that if there is a situation where none of them achieves the desired threshold, then we'll go for a runoff. That is how I want to believe that we are going to conduct ourselves. And, and I think that that is the narrative that we should push. This idea that individuals go into a race on the assumption that if we don't win, mm. it is rigged. Or if we don't win, we will not accept it. It must be the case that this is a competition of ideas and Kenyans will make a decision and I want to believe that the elections will be conducted in a free atmosphere. And one of the things that is amazing, because of our past experience, the presidential election has almost been pre-litigated mm. in <laughs> terms of every issue that was thought to stand in the way of transparency and openness mm. has been dealt with by the courts. And I think that that is a good thing. Yeah. So when we come on the 8th, Everybody is going to ensure that they have their representatives, people are there, people are going to be vigilant, and those who think that they are going to steal the vote are going to be smoked out, and Kenya is going to be a good place on the <laughs> night. <laughs> you see, the, yeah. I think it's one of, it, I'm, I'm not sure there's anything that is going to, to lead us to a runoff, because we have two major candidates. The other candidates between themselves will be lucky to get 2% of the vote. So in a sense, the, 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 the election will most probably be determined in the first round. Mm. I think one of the things we need to come to terms with as Kenyans is that whoever wins the election is a person that this country has, has chosen, and that person deserves the opportunity to run the country. You see, you see, Jeff, one of the challenges in this country is that we, we have defined our politics in extremis, you know, in its extreme, so that you go to places which are jubilated, and it's almost like Raila Odinga is the devil incarnate, is evil. He, we cannot dare have the country under the, the hands of this man. That is wrong. I mean, Honorable Raila Odinga is, is a decent human being. He's a person who this country owes a, a, a gift of gratitude. He has paid a personal price to be, to be where he, to, for Kenya to be where it is. You know, and he, if he wins the elections in, in, on 9th of, uh, of August, this country will not come to an end. You know, this country will continue. Mm. Same with his, his, uh, with, uh, his, uh, his opposer, uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta. I, I have known the president, worked under him for some time. He's one of the most decent human beings I know at, at a personal level. Mm. And, I, and I believe that he desires the best for this country. And if he's elected, I believe he will do well. And I think we need to speak that to both sides of the political divide and their supporters and say these are decent Kenyans who deserve leadership. Let us listen to their policies. And when they win, they'll actually take this country to another level. Mm. This demonizing where we act like it is either or is unacceptable and it's not healthy. And, yeah, and uh, makes that point you made earlier on, yeah. being seen together in a room, debate will calm those fears as well. Even when, they, let me tell you, you know even when uh, President Huru Kenyatta calls Raila Odinga at a function and calls him, uh, you know, uh, Tinga, my brother, yes. that brings down tensions because he says to Kenya, this thing is not as big as we think. You know, the reality is these are peop people seeking leadership. And at the end of the day, this country will continue. Remember that the place, the time when the presidency determined everything are gone. The truth of the matter is we are now a country ruled a lot by law. A lot of us in the elite don't like to tell Kenyans that because we are competing for that little space at the top. And because we own national conversation, we make it seem like this country is going to, uh, to come to an end unless X happens. But that's because we are the ones who occupy that space. The rest of the country actually now operates in a very systemized mm. process. So we need to disabuse Kenyans of the function that we are going to have a national crisis. These stories about Kenya burning is irresponsible. Absolutely. Kenya will not burn. Absolutely. And we're going to have a free and reasonably fair. Election. Dr. Ari, speaking of uh, candidates in seemingly opposition zones, Raila in Kiambu yesterday, the president in Western. Look at the crowds. That is a good thing. What we are beginning to demonstrate, and we've got to give credit to the electorate who turn up and are very good natured. And what I want to believe, even if it is not true, is that those who turned up in Kiambu, uh, of some of them, of course, it was curiosity because Honorable Odinga has been demonized in that. And yesterday they humanized mm -hmm. them. 
They saw that he's a human being, he's a decent individual, mm -hmm. and he's simply saying, I want the opportunity to serve this country. When you come out to vote, vote for me on the basis of the ideas that I'm bringing on the table, which are superior to the ideas that are being articulated by Honorable Kenyatta. And when Honorable Kenyatta went to West and he's saying, I've tried to serve uh, a little successes, some failures which he doesn't admit, but a little successes, give me another, turn, another round so that I can serve. And that is what I want to do. I would want to see Honorable Kenyatta in my rural home in Usenge in Siaya <laughs> articulating his issues. Nobody is going to stone him. We want to hear him. Let him tell us what he's going to do about fish. Let him tell us what he's going to do about cotton. Who knows? He may win one or two votes here, and that would be a good thing. <laughs> and, those and, two is, votes and those two votes may just help him out, <laughs> in the same way that another two votes may help one Robodinga. Yes. So going forward, and this is why I can't agree with Waiganjo more, I want to see a one-on-one -on -one debate where these two individuals are in the room, excuse me, Honorable Jirongo, where Honorable Raila and Honorable uh, Uhuru are in the room and are being asked very specific questions, mm. pointed questions mm. about critical issues, so that the electorate can also know it is not a life and death issue. Mm. And allow me to say one thing. Mm. The problem that we have, and I know I'll not earn friends out of saying this, is those of us who think that if President Kenyatta wins the election, they are going to be appointed in cabinet mm -hmm. or appointed as permanent secretaries or as ambassadors. We are the ones who imprison these leaders. Those of us who think that if Honorable Odinga becomes the president, they are already thinking, I'll be in treasury. I'll be the ambassador at the court of St. James. And so when you tell them that they are going to lose and yet they have painted these rosy pictures, they are going to hold you by the throat mm. and tells you that you are Lucifer himself. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Both of you mentioned crowds. Yeah. And the crowds have been massive for both candidates. It almost looks like it's the same crowd but with different t-shirts and caps. Come over. <laughs> <laughs> I think that part of it is a sad story because uh, it also says that we have a large population of Kenyans that are fairly idle. Mm. And, uh, and, and so it's something to be, it's good that Kenyans are, are, you know, politically active. But sometimes I wish, particularly in the agricultural areas, I wish sometimes you'd go and you find that there, there are no people turning up. Mm. They're out there farming. Mm. But having said that, I think it's, remember that it's, a lot of this is also done to intimidate your rivals. This election is going to be about turnout and about how you're able to encourage your team to, and, 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 Part of the reason that people turn out is the feeling that they are winning. You know, they can see this thing is in the bag. Mm -hmm. So they actually do, that there's an excitement about that. So those numbers are also part of political theater and part of, part of political activism. It's how you get votes. But I do hope that uh, we will move away from defining our politics purely through those platforms. Because those platforms are like uh, the church. You just go and speak and you go home. Nobody questions you. Nobody asks anything. Nobody reminds you that this is what you have said mm -hmm. in the many years you've been in government and why were you not able to deliver that time. You know, so no, those questions are not asked of you. What I hope is we'll have more opportunities, even if you're having the sort of formats of town halls, where you actually sit and people, their exchange of views, you know, even if it's not in the sort of debate that we're talking about. Yeah. One wants to encourage a lot more of those town halls where you have smaller groups and people actually, you know, uh, are judged on the basis of issues that they have been, you know, uh, asked about. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, do you agree with that? I can't agree more mm. that going forward we've got to have crowds that engage the political leadership. The, the politicians that we, we have, sometimes I think they have great contempt for the electorate. They come and promise that they will build bridges where there is no river. They'll create uh, uh, ice out of fire. And they tell us they are going to do all these things. When I hear some of what I call platform position, they can get away with it. But if they were in a town hall setting, they would be asked, you are telling us, and this is one of the things that yeah. they are saying, yeah. they are telling us they are going to give us free secondary education. First of all, it must be made known to Kenyans that there is nothing free. Everything is paid for by the taxpayers. Somebody pays. There is no free health care. There is no free maternity. There is no free primary education. It is not free. Somebody will pay for it. And we want to tell them, don't use the word free. 
say that it will be financed by the taxpayer and the individual therefore will not make a direct contribution and these cannot be articulated at a public rally mm. they can only be articulated at a debate or at a town hall meeting so going forward when we mature and i hope sooner rather than later we will have those forums and these individuals will think twice before they make some of the promises that they are making mm. In fact, that's how you notice. If you, if you compare the, the NASA manifesto and the Jubilee manifesto, you recognize that Jubilee's manifesto is very cautious. And you know why? Mm. Because they overpromised in 2013. And, and I think you notice that the, 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 the promises now are a little more cautious. Mm. And they are a lot more informed by reality. Because if you look at, for example, one of the contradictions of the NASA manifesto, and I'm talking about the one with the program yeah. of action. Because there's too many There's too many manifestos. Yeah. They are sort of related, but one has a program and implementation plan. Is that it promises to reduce the national debt, but it promises a significant number of projects. And you think to yourself, where are you going to get the funds to do those projects? You either have to tax people more or borrow. That is what Jubilee did. When Jubilee promised the amount of roads they are going to construct, the SGR, you realize you have only two sources of revenue. You either uh, tax people who are already struggling or you borrow. And so in a sense, the problem with governance is that you cannot be as ambitious if, if you know that you're going to be held accountable to deliver on those promises because a lot of those things are contradictions. The advantage of town hall debates is that they are not like manifestos. You have to be able to justify what you are saying. Mm. And, and even when you present a manifesto, people will even ask you to cost it and to say this is what we have promised, mm. this is how we're going to pay for it. Even the debate about what is free, when you talk about uh, free secondary education, what are you talking about? Those details will never be found in public rallies and in manifestos. You need environments where people are questioned. That way we hold you accountable. When you come back next time and you have failed, we're able to say you did not deliver on the specifics that you promised. You can't do that in a public line. Yeah. yeah. One thing they do real well in public rallies is dance. Which, which I find, I know, I, and I've said this and I repeat it again. We Africans have danced for too long. <laughs> we had better stop dancing and begin thinking and acting in the right. Yeah. This, this is not an extravaganza. This is not a show. This is not Mbilia Bell. Mm. Let us leave that to Mbilia Bell. Who's in town, by the way? Mbilia. Let's leave that to Mbilia Bell. Yeah. What I want to see is that my prospective leaders across the political divide are on a podium and are articulating issues in a manner that promises delivery. I want to hear them on agriculture. When I hear them talking about doing so many things, I want to hear them telling, how are you going to do it when Zoya is collapsing, when Barclays Bank is closing its branches, when Nakumat is going, when Uchumi is going, when 30 hotels are closing in Mombasa, when Yana is moving to India. I want to hear with a thinning tax base, how are you going to engage in this? Is it abracadabra voodoo economics mm. that you are articulating to us? And when you dance, what you do is that you appeal to the emotions of the electorate is demagoguery and I think that countries such as ours require very careful thinking they, the, the people ought to see their leader serious yeah. the people ought to see their leader among the Baganda and I've said this before the Kabaka does not dance hmm. the Kabaka is serious the Kabaka is regal our leaders must be regal without being alienated. Yeah. You've danced for too long. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, PLO would never have uh, the, the sorts of crowds that those dances pull. Yes. You know, and those dances are meant to, you know, to, to attract the crowds. Right. But, but I think the, the, the reality is that um, one of the challenges, and I hate to say this, when I watched the, the Nairobi uh, gubernatorial debate, mm. I was left with a, a very sad feeling for, I thought, this is, you know Nairobi is the tech capital of the two-thirds world. We are the 50 cities you must attend by C CNN. Mm -hmm. And this, this is what we're going to have to choose from. And I think we must allow more opportunities for us to be able to see the sorts of leaders that we are, we are electing mm. as they pronounce themselves on issues. When we leave it to the podiums and the rallies, you know, the big rallies, we never actually get to, to realize 
The people have not interrogated a lot of the issues that they talk about a lot. And because they have not interrogated them, and because of where we place leadership in this country, we believe our leaders know everything. We never question them, even when they take us to the wrong direction. Because they've never reflected on these issues, the country can actually collapse as they take us in that direction. Yeah. We must look for more opportunities to interrogate our leaders long before we even get to the vote. Because right now, we are caught up in a situation in Nairobi where I believe most Nairobi voters are struggling with whether they are going to vote yeah. at all. Yeah. Because we have a problem across the board. And I think we can't afford that as we go forward at different levels. Yeah, you know why? Because they say, be careful what you wish for, you yeah. may just get Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Gentlemen, yeah. let's take a break, come back, and let's stretch out. Let's go across the country. Kisumu County, Migori, Homa Bay, Kirinyaga, Mombasa even, Machakos. There's some battleground states. There's going to be some heavy, heavy fights out there. It's going to be interesting to see. I told you these gentlemen were brilliant. Listen to the articulation. Jubilites and Nasserites can make this stuff up. Keep tweeting. At Kamodo Waiganju, at Kinanga Jeff, at Citizen TV Kenya. Hashtag is JK Live. Monica, do you have any new number? Oh, look at this. Was it right for the two principals to opt out of the presidential debate? 50 50. Down the middle. Keep tweeting. JKL takes a break. We'll be back in a moment.